<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. This is uh, the tenth of the ox herding pictures today, and uh, it's called "Entering the Marketplace." Maybe many of you are aware of the of the image, which is of a, a monk with a bare chest and uh, walking into the market with a big bag over his shoulder. Yeah. And uh, you've probably seen statues of this guy in Chinese restaurants. <laughs> um, you know, he has a big, big belly and, and, uh, and a lot of people who just go to Chinese restaurants thinks that's a Buddha. Um, but of course, the uh, Buddha is uh, a lot of the images of the Buddha show when he was uh, an ascetic. You could just see his ribs and all that. He, he and none of the images I've seen of the Shakyamuni Buddha had a, a big belly like, like this fellow. His name is Hote, Hote, Hote. And actually, there was a historical person by that name who lived in a, in the 10th century in China. And uh, he um, was depicted like this, you know, uh, wandering around and uh, acting in kind of a simple way. The children loved him. He played with the children. And, and I heard that he had this big, he's always depicted with a big bag, a sack over his shoulder. And... Uh, and I had heard that he, in the sack, he had what uh, what people want. He he didn't give them what they need. He gave them what they want. There's a difference, right? Like Santa Claus. <laughs> like what? Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Oh, okay. But I don't think he had lumps of coal. No. <laughs> they need that. <laughs> no. No. And he was always, um, sometimes he's called the happy Buddha, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, I read uh, just uh, his little bit about Hote and, and uh I'll, I'll re read it precisely, but um, he claimed that he was a reincarnation of Maitreya Buddha, um, which is interesting because Maitreya Buddha is the Buddha of the future. So how can you be a reincarnation of the Buddha of the future? <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> um, and of course, the Abbey here is called Maitreya. Abbey, you know, which is uh, building future Buddhas, but uh, but my Maitreya uh, supposedly appeared in many forms in many places, and uh, uh, you, you may know that uh, psychologically speaking, the Buddhist uh, philosophy divides the world into six realms of existence. And one of these is the hell realms, which uh, you go to when you do uh, undesirable things. And of course, the realm of the hungry ghosts who are never satisfied, no matter how much they get. And there's the other realm of the fighting spirits who are always angry. And uh, it's a realm of animals. And uh, the, the way that animals are depicted is they have no conscience. You know, they don't, uh, they don't feel guilt or shame, <laughs> you know, whatever they do, you know, they just do it out of their animal instinct. And then there's uh, the realm of the uh, heavenly spirits uh, who um, are always uh, blissful, but uh, don't really pay attention to anybody else but their own bliss and then the realm of humans which uh it's it's said that only in the human realm is it possible to realize buddha um, 
uh, these other realms are too um, self-indulgent in, in whatever their issues are that they that aren't able to uh, throw off their shackles. But what Maitreya does, and also Jizo Bodhisattva, is they go to all of these realms and they help liberate the people there. And uh, so that uh, they can be relieved of their suffering. And actually that was the main intent of the of Shakyamuni Buddha when he started on his pilgrimage was to relieve suffering, you know, and that's what uh, Maitreya Buddha does. And that's what this Hote as a manifestation of Maitreya Buddha does too. And it says that he goes into places that Buddhist monks usually wouldn't go into, you know, like brothels, you know, or, or butcher shops, or fish markets, you know, or uh, I don't know, he goes into uh, bars and liberates all of the drunkards and the prostitutes and the uh, and those who, who kill animals and, uh, and he's not afraid to go into these places he doesn't avoid them he goes in them. and so that's who this uh Hote represents but uh, so this is considered the the highest stage you know of the 10 ox earning pictures and uh, and you know you might ask well, is is he enlightened? You know, I mean, he's look at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a uh, a well-known koan of uh, Master Nansen, uh, where he says that nowadays people see this flower as if in a dream. So what is a dream and what's not a dream? What's enlightened and what's not enlightened, you know? I mean, this this fellow doesn't seem to have a lot of worries or concerns, but, you know, and he seems to be simple. The children love him. He plays with them, you know, and he, and he, uh, and he uh, reaches out to drunkards. So... That's one of the things that we have talked about was that when somebody's enlightened, that they're not recognized as such, at least in our tradition. Yeah. In, in Zen, we revere what's called the hazy moon of enlightenment. And I don't know if you've looked at a hazy moon and there's the clouds and the moon is behind it. And then the clouds might part a little bit and you see the moon there and then it gets covered up and you say, is there a moon there or not? Is he enlightened or not? You know. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, you know, and then in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they talk about the bright sun of enlightenment. <laughs> so there, you know, they, they make, it's more uh, showy, but that's just, that one's not better than the other. It's just, that's the Zen way. It's not, not to make a big display, you know. So, um, uh, So he's also uh, revered in in uh, China and uh, Japan and Korea. Vietnam is uh, because of his big belly. It's supposed to represent good fortune, you know, abundance, abundance of good fortune. So uh, he's uh, revered, you know, and there are statues of him that people have in order to to bless their home with uh, enough, you know, to live. So, so that's uh, it's Hote. And uh, at one point in his, uh, later in his life, actually, Bernie Glassman felt that uh, his Sangha, the, the uh, energy in there was much 
too rigid and stiff and serious. And so he decided he wanted to learn how to be a clown. And uh, he sought out uh, Wavy Gravy, who you, uh, those of you who know San Francisco in the 60s and 70s know who he is. He was a, a clown. And the Wavy Gravy put him in, in uh, contact with, with a man named Mr. Yuhu. And uh, uh, I've met Mr. Yuhu many times. He's been part of, of the Zen community. His, his given name is Moshe Cohen. So uh, he, um, Bernie, uh, apprenticed with Mr. Yuhu and uh, went with him for clowns without borders. You know, they go to uh, places where there's conflict in the world and and they entertain the people and the children, you know, make them laugh and and even just for a moment, forget about all the suffering that's going on there. And, and Bernie used, you know, had a red nose that he used to put on in meetings sometimes when he uh, to try and lighten up the atmosphere. So, and uh, the kind of clown he was was more like a, a coyote or a court jester, you know, which would had was very incisive and would would comment on people when they're out of. Uh, in a, in a way, just kind of showing the irony of the way some people are behaving. So this uh, hote is, is supposed to be jolly like that, you know, not taking anything too seriously, but at the same time, his mission is to liberate people. And uh, let me read a commentary about this uh, stage. It says that it's called entering the market with open hands. And it says, whoever has brought the experience of truth to completion in him or herself goes into the world to liberate others. He or she immerses and concentrates themselves in liberating. All Buddhas and Masters have done this since ancient times. Out of the boundless compassion that springs forth, they throw themselves into the dusty world and with their great vow, turn their hand to liberating all worldly beings. Can their behavior be described as moral or religious? No neither the one nor the other. They're doing, uh, they're doing, and the unhindered life of Zen, which flows through it, cannot be pressed into the framework of ethics. No one can render the free play of their life intellectually comprehensible. It's beyond laws or rules. It is actually from this freely playing life that all moral laws and religious rules spring from in the first place. So they appear in the realm of the Buddha, the realm of hell, and in worldly passions and wisdom at will. They bury their uh, illuminated nature and visit the wine shops and fish stalls to awaken the drunkards there to themselves. There is a self-immersing and self-concentrating in the play of the original self. And from, um, there's a, a book of, uh, the transmission of light, which has a bunch of stories about uh, various uh, Zen priests in China. And, and the uh, section about Hote says that uh, the priest Hote had a supple body, small brow, and large stomach. His speech was quite unruly. He slept anywhere he wanted, 
and on his staff he always carried a large cloth bag in which he put his personal belongings and a wrapped up cushion for sitting. He went begging through town or village. And in March of the third year of the Chen Ming of the Liang dynasty, Ho Te was dying. And he sat on a rock near uh, Yulin Si Temple and recited the following verse. It said, Maitreya, true Maitreya, you are distributed in countless selves and conceal yourself in them. You always show yourself before people of the present day. Nevertheless, no one knows you. And then having sung this verse, he quietly died. And then later, people said he appeared and uh, went about with his cloth bag as before. Yeah. So uh, he was reincarnated also and still appears. You know, like I said, you see him not only in wine shops and fish stalls, but in Chinese restaurants. <laughs> yeah. And um, so according to legend, uh, uh, Maitreya, who's the future Buddha, will appear in the world uh, when the future ends uh, to liberate those who haven't had the opportunity of hearing Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, either directly or through his lineage. And some people therefore believe Maitreya will uh, supplement Shakyamuni, but in the last resort, it's the realization of the great vow to liberate all beings now and in the future. And Hote was an embodiment of Maitreya who deliberately turned away from the beaten track of the old masters and liberated people in towns and villages. And in his speech and conduct uh, amazed everyone. So. So there's a, a verse that goes with this 10th uh, oxerting picture. And it goes like this. With bare chest and feet, he enters the market. His face is smeared with earth, his head covered with ashes. A huge laugh streams over his cheeks. Without humbling himself to perform miracles or wonders, he suddenly makes the withered trees bloom. So with bare chest and feet, he enters the market. So he mixes with uh, the light and the dust with an open and generous heart. And what can one call him? An independent, open-hearted, and really human being, a fool, a saint. So he's called actually the holy fool. He hides nothing. See, nothing is hidden. It's like uh, when the Buddha's successor, uh, Mahakashapa, uh, became the 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 first uh, uh, Buddhist ancestor, uh, he was attended by Ananda, who uh, who had attended was the attendant of the of the Buddha before he was the attendant for Ananda, and uh, Ananda um, I, I mentioned him before. He had a remarkable memory. He remembered everything that the Buddha said, uh, and. Um, when the sutras were written, they said, thus I have heard, and that's how a lot of the sutras started, thus I have heard, that I is Ananda, thus I have heard, and then, and then all of the sutra would 
would be written. But he um, wasn't an arhat. He hadn't had awakening experience, you know, so uh, he wasn't part of the council that put together the Buddhist teachings. He just told them what they were, and they assembled them. <laughs> and, uh, and then finally, after attending to uh, Mahakashapa for 20 years, he said, besides, he knew all of the public teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, so he figured there must be something secret that he didn't know, you know, because he hadn't had an awakening experience. So he said to Mahakashapa, he said, besides the robe and the bowl, did the, did the, did the Buddha give you something else? Come on, <laughs> tell me. And so um, Mahakashapa called out to him and said, Ananda. And Ananda said, yes, sir. And he said, knock down the flagpole at the front gate. And maybe some of you know this expression. Well, in other words, when there's a Dharma dialogue, they put up a flag in, in the monastery. When, the dialogue, when it's over, they take the flag down. So he's saying, this discussion is finished. And what, what more do you want? I called and you answered. Nothing is hidden. That's what they're saying. It's right there. That's it. And that's when Ananda suddenly had his awakening and realization experience. Knocked down the flagpole at the front gate. Don't add anything extra. See? The Dharma dialogue, the Dharma debate, the Dharma discussion. It's complete. Whole and complete as it is. Nothing is hidden. And that's what it says about Kote, he hides nothing. I have nothing to hide from you. His face is smeared with earth, his head covered with ashes. Thus he wanders around from morning till night in the town, in other words, like a fool in the dusty world. He freely throws himself into the painful heaving sea of suffering and liberates those who are sunk in it. He shows the magnificence of the Buddha without building temples. Everything that his playful being takes in hand becomes true and shines in its original light. No one can get to the bottom of this play and a huge laugh streams over his cheeks. So no one can get to the bottom of this play. <laughs> you know, that's like we trying to find, you know, the original cause of what caused it, you know. I'm sure those of you who went to religious school were told that God created everything, but I was a bit of an impertinent kid and I would ask who created God if you know, but God created everything. And you know, the famous story about uh, the guru and the scholar who um, in, in, uh, in both Hindu and I think in Buddhist uh, theology, they said that the earth is sitting on the back of an elephant, you know? And of course the scholar said, well, what's the elephant standing on? And, and he says, oh, it's easy, he's standing on a crocodile. And then what's a crocodile standing on? Oh, yes, a turtle. And, and then the scholar starts to ask him again, and he says, look, I'll save you a lot of trouble. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, no one can get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And what does the last turtle stand on? Oh, it's turtles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a huge laugh streams over his cheeks. Without humbling himself to perform miracles or wonders, he suddenly makes the withered trees bloom. But there's neither magic, mystery, nor wonder in the real truth. Whoever thinks there is, is on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, sometimes um, people, when they meditate, they might find that they awaken some some talents or powers they didn't know they had. But the, uh, my teacher and other teachers always say that's not the point of Zen. That might happen, but don't. If you focus on them, there's koans about that too, about people who claim they have supernatural powers. So, you know, I won't go into that right now, but the, but uh, usually in the koan, it just shows that they're barking up the wrong tree, so to speak. So we'll get to him, what he does. Um, but of course, we, there's all kinds of uh, things we can do in Zen, you know, like those of you who worked on koans, there's one like, uh, um, uh, take a seven story pagoda out of a teapot. We can do that. Or take Mount Fuji out of your uh, robe sleeve. We can do that too. Or, uh, or create a mountain or put yourself in a wooden post and that's nothing magical it's just everyday triviality so he suddenly makes the withered trees bloom we again remember the vow numberless creations I vow to liberate. Sentient beings are innumerable, I vow to liberate them all. So, he takes suffering peoples and make them bloom, that's what this means. Huh? He makes ordinary worldly people become Buddha in a sudden flash. So in reference to training, it means leaping out of the great no into the great yes. And this holy fool is the inexhaustible play in our original note in the melody of life. Here, the vividly living active being of an all embracing origin is at play. It's said that a hote lives an enlightened life without enlightenment. Or I think it was uh, Roshi Shinko studied with uh, Philip Kaplow, who used to say you, you lead an ordinary life, but in an extraordinary way. So hote's immeasurable freedom and unrestricted action adjust according to the conditions. He visits one house and then another. In one house, he has the face of a horse. In another house, he might have the face of a donkey, according to conditions. He appears to be a worldling, an ordinary person, sometimes a Buddha, a saint, sometimes an idiot. But he manages to well, disrupt everything, and an empty world opens. So everything is knocked away. All becomes clear and transparent. So, it said that the uh, Buddha had three bodies, the uh, Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Nomanakaya. And uh, I didn't talk about this, but these correspond to the last three stages of the uh, Oxford pictures. And the Nomanakaya is... Uh, the way that um, 
Shakyamuni Buddha appears in the world, and he appears in this case as Hote. And Nirmanaka is a fully awakened state of being in the world. Its actions is like the moon reflecting in a hundred bowls of water. The moon has no desire to reflect, but that's its nature. The state is dealing with the earth with ultimate simplicity, transcending, following the example of anyone. So you let go of whatever needs to be let go of. You subdue whatever needs to be subdued. And you care for whatever needs your care. So even though this is considered to be the 10th stage, my teacher, uh, my Zumi Roshi emphasized that in our lineage, this 10th stage appears throughout your entire training. Always, you know, we're mindful of our vows, our precepts, and we don't restrict or limit them. But that's what this stage represents is the boundless love and compassion that emanates from this practice that has been hewn from impenetrable rock over the preceding stages, you know, of putting one's focus and energy into one's practice and, and then bringing forth the spirit of this stage in each step along the way until it becomes more and more innate and ingrained. You know, um, the way, one of the, the metaphors that I use, and of course it's not original with me, is it's like when you're walking in a fine mist, you know, at first you, it's easy, you don't notice it. And then after you've been walking long enough, you begin to notice that your clothes are, are soaking wet, you know, but it happens gradually and then suddenly you notice it. And uh, but you continue going on. Because once you're wet, you can't get any wetter. <laughs> but still, that's what the, that's what Hote is. That's what this is. So maybe I'll stop there. <laughs>